Hello, I'm Mark Allen. Today I'm going to try to show you what I am doing with mechanical or nickel disc spinning television at the Spark Museum of Electrical Invention here in Bellingham, Washington. The video will be in two parts. The first part will be an overview and a live demonstration of the operation of mechanical television, both for the kit that we have and the Baird Televisor. That's the most exciting part of this video. The remainder of the video is my explanation of what I have done to convert computer video files to the video format used for mechanical television. Enjoy. Prior to television as we know it now, or electronic television, sometime around 1926 or so, they came out with what's called mechanical television. Mechanical television consists of a rotating disc with holes around its edge in a spiral pattern. The Spark Museum has two mechanical television units. The one on the left is an open unit, it's called a kit. This was sold in parts and you would assemble it and use it to experiment with mechanical television. It was not a real product that would be ready for regular use. On the other hand, in Great Britain, John Baird came up with a mechanical television unit that is a more formal product and consists of a cabinet. You can see the disc-shaped portion of the cabinet. Inside that is a spinning disc. On the right hand side of it is the viewport window. On the left hand side and in the center are two controls that are used to manually synchronize the television unit. I'm going to come close to the open mechanical television unit so you can see the arrangement of holes. We try to zoom in and now you can see the start to see the holes that surround the outer edge of the disc. On top you see a magnifying glass. That's the viewing port for the unit. I'm going to manually turn the disc so you can see what happens. As the disc turns, if it turns fast enough, the holes form lines. That's due to persistence of fusion. If this turns faster yet again, the lines will blur together to form a band. In front, behind the magnifying glass, you see about a small square formed by the spinning holes and the lines. Behind that, right here, is a neon bulb. The flashing neon bulb is in synchronization of the spinning disc. That paints an image taking advantage of persistence of vision, which is a physiological effect of the human eye. I'm going to start, I'm going to turn the lights in the room down and start the spinning disc. As you can see, the neon bulb is starting to flicker. Now if I come in front of the disc and zoom in,
you can see the image of myself dancing in front of the camera. That is caused by the spinning of the disc. Next, I'm going to try to show you the image on the bear. Here you see the image as seen on the viewport of the Baird Mechanical Television. For the exhibit, these images are automatically held in synchronization. During the day when this was made, that was not true. I'm going to attempt to show you what it's like to try to synchronize the image on the screen. As you can see, the image is now out of synchronization. I'm going to try to adjust the speed of the motor. And now you can see the image coming close to synchronization. The viewers often have to do this to keep the picture synchronized. I'm going to go back to automatic synchronization. So this allows the viewer to at least see the image if it's properly synchronized and make it easier for museum viewers. However, if you want to experience what things were like, and you take it out of automatic synchronization and try to synchronize the image yourself. Here is an attempt to show both the flickering neon ball on which there is no image, but you're seeing the image as viewed through the spinning holes of the spinning disc. It's not very clear. I'm hoping you see the idea on how mechanical television works. Now that you've seen the image, I'm going to now try to explain how my project works and how I built it. The signal processing unit, which is this homemade chassis here, consists of the actual digital unit or single board computer, which is right here. This is a Raspberry Pi. That generates the digitized video signal for both the kit and the Baird. In addition, it takes the timing pulses from the sensors that I had to build for both the kit and the Baird so that the signal is in sync with the two respective disks. The circuit board next to it, this one here, is an analog, I'm sorry, is a digital to analog converter. It uses a simple resistor ladder that takes the four bit digital signal that's provided for each the Baird and the kit and convert that to a 16 value analog signal. That analog signal for both the Baird and the kit is sent over to this circuit board which is a signal conditioner. That circuit board consists of two op amps. Those one op amp for the signal for the Baird and one op amp for the signal for the kit. The four variable resistors are used to adjust the gain of each respective op amp as well as the offset. After the signal leaves the op amp, it goes to a high voltage, high power metal oxide field effect transistor or MOSFET for short. Normally, MOSFETs are used for switching. I am taking the rather esoteric use of a MOSFET and using it for, um, for linear amplification. The linear range of a MOSFET is very small and very specific. So that's why I chose to 
have the gain and the offset for each of the op amps set by trim potentiometers rather than fixed resistors so that I can adjust those while the system is running. Furthermore, the metal, the MOSFETs may vary in performance over time. So after a period of time of use, we may need to readjust the operation of the op amps. Elsewhere on this chassis, we have several power supplies. Now, to make things really cheap, I wanted to take advantage of wall warts or power pack modules that I already have either in my shop or the um, parts pile at the museum. We have one, two, three, we have four wall warts on this system. The very back one here supplies five volts to the Raspberry Pi. When you turn the power on on the unit, that energizes this power supply so the Raspberry Pi can boot. The two wall warts here, these are minus 12 and plus 12 volts for the purpose of supplying the power to the op amps both on this circuit board as well as the sensors, which I'll talk about later. This power supply is to supply the 16 volts DC power for the LED array, which is used in the Baird. The transformer here, along with a bridge rectifier and filters underneath the chassis, provide 400 volts DC, which is required for the neon bulb. Now I'm going to show you briefly the underneath the chassis. Here's the underside of the chassis of the video signal processing unit. As you remember, the Raspberry Pi is and the amplifiers are mounted above the chassis. Here is the terminal strip for the push buttons and the LEDs. There are three LEDs. The first one indicates when power is applied to the unit. The second one indicates that the system is running and the two mechanical TV units are running. The third one indicates that we are in free running mode for the Baird without the Baird being synchronized to the video signal. Over here is where the power comes in. There's a fuse and a switch, and here is the relay I mentioned that is engaged when somebody presses the button to start the system. That relay powers the plus and minus 12-volt power supplies, the 15-volt power supply, as well as the high-voltage power supply, and it powers the electrical outlet for the motors. Over here is the wiring for the high voltage, it's a 400 volts for the neon tube. The rectifier block is right here. These are the bleeder resistors and these are the filter capacitors. Over here you see two MOSFETs. Those are the two high voltage and high current MOSFETs. One that drives the neon bulb and one that drives the LED array. Over here is the wiring for the low voltage power supplies and their connection to the Baird and to the kit. I've added additional filter capacitors to remove any ripples due to the um, resistance of the wiring from the power supplies. Over here is the wiring for the switches and the LEDs. The, cha the overall chassis I constructed using a sheet of scrap steel that was on hand at the museum. I used a plasma cutter to cut the 
sides of the chassis that I take welded the sides to the top of the chassis. The four legs are some scrap um, socket wrenches that I found for about 50 cents at a local used hardware store. So that's pretty much it for the underside of the chassis. Okay, here's the highest level I got for the work to be done. The video files I chose to use as an animated GIF file, the type of computer file. That file is fed into the software that I wrote, takes each of the frames from that animated GIF file and converts them to the appropriate frames for both the Baird and the kit. And that software also outputs each of the pixels using a 4-bit value to the hardware that will convert them from digital to analog and prepare them to be used in either the neon bulb or the LED array in front of the disc. In addition, there is a photodiode and sensor at the edge of the disc to detect the presence of the holes that creates a timing pulse back to the software. So the software can synchronize the signal to the disk. Now some interesting things that need to be done. First of all, an image from a GIF file is 512 by 512 or maybe it's 512 by 1024. Those are pixels, so 512 pixels per line, 512 lines to the image. The Baird or the kit have far fewer lines and far fewer pixels. I believe for the Baird, without looking it up, it's 30 lines and about 30 pixels per line. That means that each pixel for the Baird is going to be several pixels for the GIF, so essentially 30 512 divided by 30, the result is the number of pixels in that direction that for the GIF image, that's represented by one pixel of the um, kit or the Baird image. So 512 divided by 30, uh, without having a calculator, I'm guessing that's going to be about close to 15. Same, so it would be 15 by 15. So each pixel here is represented by a block of 15 by 15 pixels here. So that's how we have to convert the image. What we also have to do is convert the timing. The video signal for the mechanical television, each, each frame, is approximately 50 milliseconds in duration because there's approximately 18 frames per second. Now within each frame there are 30 lines. Each line is approximately 2 milliseconds long. That timing of course is determined by the timing of the pulses received by the photodiode on the unit. Next, I'm going to talk about the image Cartesian conversion. Now we come to perhaps the most challenging part of the image conversion to describe. What I've drawn here are the pixel order of the images for a GIF file and the kit and the Baird. In an animated GIF file, the pixels are organized going from left to right for each line or each row. And the rows are organized from top to bottom. Now, a GIF image that has been resized for the Baird or the kit uh, pixel zero, 0, will be upper left-hand corner. Then we go to pixel 30 of line 0 at the upper right-hand corner. 
So the next line, which would be line, a pixel zero line one, would be down here, the line count down. That's for the GIF image. For the kit, pixel zero zero is on the upper right hand corner. Each line is scanned from right to left. So here is pixel 30 of line 0. Now here is pixel 0 <coughs> of line 30. And the end of the image here, lower left hand corner, is pixel 30 of line 30. Now pixel 0 of line 1 will be here. Now the Baird is most tricky. The origin of the Baird image is at the lower right hand corner. Pixel 0 of line 0. Each line scans upward. So that means pixel 30 of line 0 or row 0 is the upper right hand corner. Then pixel 1 no, the pixel 0 of line 1 is here. Then it goes up. So the lines or the rows count from right to left. So here is pixel 0 of line 30. And finally, pixel 30 of line 30. So the software has to do this altering of the Cartesian coordinates on the fly as each the kit and the bird are scanned. This is perhaps the most challenging part of the video conversion process to describe. Basically what I have to do is take the, each image in the animation, animated GIF file and reduce its resolution for the corresponding image that's sent to the Baird and the, and the um, kit. Each image in an animated GIF file is 512 pixels in the horizontal direction and 512 pixels in the vertical direction. Because each row is 512 pixels and there are 512 rows. For the kit or for the Baird, we have 30 pixels for each row and 30 rows, which means 30 in the horizontal, 30 in the vertical. Therefore, we have to reduce the resolution from 512 by 512 to 30 by 30. That is not as simple as grabbing the first 30 pixels in this direction and the first 30 pixels in this direction. But if you did that, you'd miss the rest of the image. So what I have to do is take for each pixel for the Baird or the kit, that pixel represents a block of 17 pixels in the horizontal direction and 17 pixels in the vertical direction. I came up with that by taking 512, which is the number of pixels in each direction, and divide that by 30 which is, no, is the number of pixels in the, each direction for the kit. You do that division, you result in 17. That means there are 17 of these pixels for each of these pixels in the vertical direction and 17 of these pixels for each of these pixels in the horizontal direction. So to try to illustrate that, each of these pixels is a block of 17 by 17 of these pixels. So what I have to do is an average. First of all, 17 rows of 17 each pixels is 289. 17 times 17 is a total of 289 pixels 
for each one of these pixels. So what I do to normalize or average, I will add the numerical value for the brightness of each of these 289 pixels that represents this one pixel with a Baird, and I do the division by 289. So that creates an average. I fully understand there are a wide variety of methods and a lot of discussion on the proper means of normalizing video pixel values when you're reducing resolution of an image. However, being that I am simulating mechanical television, and in that day, mechanical television images were very primitive and very crude. I made the decision to use the most efficient method to do the normalization, and that is a simple averaging. Sum everything and then divide it. So I do that for each one of these pixels. So this block is pixel zero horizontal, pixel zero vertical for the bear. The next block will be pixel one row one, and of course, uh, uh, pixel one, row two, uh, row zero, sorry, pixel one, row zero, this will be pixel one, row one, so, and so forth down the image. So that hopefully that explains how I do the conversion from 512 pixels by 512 pixels to 30 pixels by 30 pixels. Here is an extremely rough schematic of what I'm doing to each of the two signals. The 4-bit digital signal for each, the Baird and the kit, arrive here from the Raspberry Pi. Bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3. Each of these bits is 0 to plus 3. This is a resistor ladder. It appears something, the reaction is a resistor in, in each one of these. I made a mistake. There's a resistor across it and a resistor to each one of these. This creates here a 16 possible value analog signal from 0 volts to 3 volts. This is fed to an op amp. Signal goes into one end of a variable resistor or one of the four blue trim pots I showed you. The other end goes to the feedback from the um, output of the op amp. The slider of that pot goes to the negative input. So you have negative feedback. The positive input is adjustable for the offset. That goes to the other trim pot for that channel. That varies between actually plus 12 to minus 12 to plus 12. That sets the off, offset. So by manipulating the two pots, we can adjust the level as well as the offset of the output. The output of the op amp goes directly to the gate of a MOSFET. This is a high voltage, high current MOSFET. One, the source of the MOSFET is grounded. The drain of the MOSFET is feeds a current limiting resistor and then to the load. The load is either the neon bulb or the LED array and then you have the supply. The supply is 12, uh, 15 volts for the LED array. It is 400 volts for the neon bulb. However, since these are identical high voltage, high current MOSFETs, this entire circuitry is identical for both the Baird and the kit. Here I'm attempting to show you how I do the timing. Here we have an infrared LED. The spinning wheel is here. The LED shines its light through the hole to the photodiode. 
photodiode is attached to an op amp that amplifies the signal from the photodiode and feeds that through a capacitor to remove the DC component into a 2N2222 transistor, which inverses the signal. And that inverse signal goes to a, a blocking capacitor and then we have a signal that is normally at 5 volts, but when there's a pulse, that goes down to zero. It's driven down to zero momentarily through the action of the transistor and the capacitor to create a monostable, monostable multivibrator pulse, which comes out here. This pulse is fed to the Raspberry Pi to be used by the software to synchronize the video signal to the actual speed of the spinning disk. Here you see the kit mechanical television, but looking at it from on the edge. Right here is the disc. You're seeing it from the edge. You see two homemade circuit boards. The one on the right powers an infrared LED. You can just see the LED uh, in the middle of that board. Opposite the wheel, you see what looks like a small roll of electrical tape, which is right here. That tape right there surrounds a very sensitive photodiode. That photodiode is tuned to the same infrared frequency as the LED. That photodiode feeds an op amp that's on the circuit board. That op amp, in turn, feeds a, trans a single 2N2222 transistor to invert the signal. That's required because the triple five, the 555 multivibrator, which is used in, for as a monostable, monostable multivibrator, needs to have a negative going signal to trigger. The reason we're using a multivibrator is that as this disc spins past the photodiode, it may pick up more than one wheel, want more than one hole at any one time because of the very close spacing of the holes. So we will get a number of pulses, maybe four or five pulses per spin of the wheel. However, we only one, want, want one pulse um, for each spin of the wheel to get accurate timing of the wheel. So I set the multivibrator's pulse width to be wider than the entire width of the four pulses. So once the first pulse from the wheel triggers it, that pulse stays high long enough that all four or five pulses will have already happened before that pulse goes back low and the multivibrator resets. I'm showing you the unit in the kit because the unit in the beard has to be shielded. I'm going to briefly show you that now. Here we are looking at the beard. The wheel, this is the wheel right here. Inside this stainless steel box that I had to craft using my welding and metal cutting skills is, a, is the sensor unit. That's the circuit board with the photodiode and, and op amp and the transistor and the multivibrator. That circuit board is identical to the one I just showed you. The only difference is that it's inside this RF shield or enclosure, which acts like a Faraday cage. There's a small hole on the far side of this enclosure 
that allows the light to come through from the LED, which is on the other side, you can't see it, come through the holes and creates the trigger. The reason that we have to have this shield is because the motor on the bare unit is electrically noisy and the wheel on the Baird is electrically attached to the motor. I will show you. I'm going to come back and focus in on the motor of the Baird. As you can see, the wheel of the Baird is attached to the motor electrically. The motor frame is not grounded and there are a lot, there's a lot of electrical noise emanated from the motor, radiated by the wheel and getting into the sensitive circuits of the sensor and causing spurious pulses. If we look for a moment at the kit over here, you can see that the motor to the right is electrically isolated from the wheel. You have a rubber belt to a non-conductive um, pulley and then you come over to the wheel itself. So the wheel is about two feet from the motor and the motor is a quieter motor electrically. So therefore we do not have problem with interference on the photo detector on the kit as we do on the Baird. Well, there you have it. You have now seen what I'm doing for mechanical television at the Spark Museum of Electrical Invention here in Bellingham, Washington. If all goes well, what you've just seen will be on the floor of the museum sometime in the fall or winter of 2017. In the meantime, I hope I have given you enough so that if you wish, you could proceed on your own to create the signals for mechanical television. Thank you.